Here we go. Hey guys, and welcome to episode eight of Scientific Drinking. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about Apollo and Orion and what the differences really are between those two vehicles. Stick around, cheers. So tonight I'm drinking uh, You're My Boy Blue, uh, which is a fruity beer, blueberry wheat beer. And if you think questioning my masculinity based on my choice of fruity beer is something that will work, you're damn right, it's pretty fragile. <laughs> All right, let's first talk about a little bit of news and the elephant in the room is Boeing. Now, Boeing's had a rough year. First, it was a 737 MAX incident, uh, which were caused by negligence and complacency at Boeing headquarters. The failure of the 787 Extended Edition for the long haul trip uh, between Sydney and London had failed structural testing. And then there was the missing pin on the Starliner during the ascent abort test, which caused the drogue chute not to deploy on the third parachute. And now finally, the issue with Boeing Starliner failing to reach ISS orbit during final testing. Now. This is a huge hit for Boeing. This was all caused because the onboard timer of the Starliner capsule did not sync up with the Atlas V timer, which was the correct version. In a way that was in agreement with its onboard timer, but in disagreement with all the sensor feed that it was getting because it was at a different point in its trajectory than it thought it was. And this all occurred at stage separation where there was no coverage. Not only was the onboard timer set to the wrong time, but they couldn't tell it to get the correct time. Yeah, that kind of caps off a really bad year for Boeing, who was hoping to be ready for the first manned commercial crew flight next year, along with the Dragon capsule from SpaceX, which, by the way, is pretty much ready to go, pending a ascent abort test late this year. Now, that SpaceX ascent abort test will be the final one. You might recall that they had some issues with the ascent abort system earlier this year that caused one of the capsules to kind of blow up. Oh. But they've fixed that issue and following this last set of testing, they'll be ready to go and deploy American astronauts into space from American soil once again early next year. In other news, Blue Origin has launched another New Shepard rocket and on board was a whole group of NASA sponsored experiments and testing equipment that took advantage of this test flight. Now, commercial flights to space will be available through a number of providers very, very soon, including Virgin Galactic and indeed Blue Origin. Both of these flights are not orbital flights. They are suborbital, meaning you're just going straight up into, the, into space and coming back down. You don't have the tangential velocity required to maintain orbit or go to the International Space Station. They're smaller rockets with more limited capability, but they do take you above the common line and into space itself. So you get to be an astronaut. And finally, the picture of the black hole that was released earlier this year has been named the most influential science picture of the year. And really, I don't think anyone can really argue with that. That's an amazing picture, actually seeing the event horizon of a black hole. Uh, is astonishing. And on to our main story. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Apollo and Orion capsules and what the differences are between those two vehicles. So this entire episode is happening because I took my parents to the visitor center while they were visiting me for Thanksgiving. My mom was very enthusiastic looking and asking questions about all the displays and one of the displays is a mock-up Orion capsule which is rotating in the middle of this open plaza and she was looking at it and she finally asked what's the difference between the Orion capsule and the Apollo capsule. I didn't actually know. This seems like something I should know, right? I mean, maybe I'm not a manned space flight expert, but working here and being at the forefront of this new Artemis mission, it's kind of an important difference. You know, it's something we should be able to communicate to the public. I did the science-y thing that I'm kind of good at and I did research. So here's pretty much what I found are the differences between the Orion and Apollo capsules. Now, to talk about the differences, we need to talk about what's the same. And the obvious is that they're both capsules, right? They both re-enter the atmosphere. They both soak up heat using an ablative heat shield they splash down in the ocean and they both pretty much look similar don't they the first difference that we're going to talk about is size the orion capsule is noticeably larger than the uh, apollo capsule and the diameter of the uh, the orion capsule is about five meters while the uh, apollo capsule was 3.9 now that translates into a whole bunch of differences including a difference in internal volume from 6.2 cubic meters up to 9 cubic meters which is a significant difference meaning that you can have four crew on board instead of three and there are more differences that we'll talk about to accommodate these long this larger crew for a longer mission time that the orion capsule was designed for there's also a significant mass difference the apollo capsule weighed in at about five and a half thousand kilograms dry mass while the orion capsule 
weighs in at almost 10,000 kilograms, between 9 and 10,000 dry mass. All right, so Orion is bigger. Uh, besides that, what's really the difference? They still look the same, right? Physics hasn't changed in the past 60 years. If you took a, uh, an aircraft from the 1950s, it kind of looks similar to aircraft we have today. Even the new 787 Dreamliner is pretty much a tube with a couple of wings on it and some vertical and horizontal stabilizers in the back. Well, that's just like a DC-3 aircraft, a tube with wings on it and stabilizers in the back. It's designed that way to accommodate physics. There are some new innovative methods we can uh, delve into that talk about new aircraft design and radical new configurations that can make air travel more efficient, but it requires a radical change in the way we design vehicles. The same applies to the capsules themselves. They are designed to re-enter the atmosphere, have a blade of heat shield and splash down in the ocean. We're on the threshold of revealing some new technologies that might help uh, mitigate those effects, such as inflatable heat shields, which have a larger surface area relative to the mass of the vehicle and are able to dissipate the heat of re-entry across a larger surface, reducing the demand on materials and indeed the need for an ablative heat shield altogether. However, there are some challenges involved with the material science of that, creating something that can be inflated, but is still durable enough to handle the strains of re-entry. But that's still in the 10, 20, 30 year timeline. But right now, the ablative heat shield is the best re-entry method we have. So another difference you might notice just from looking at the vehicles behind me is that the Apollo capsule doesn't have solar panels. Well, why is that? Well, during the Apollo missions, they used fuel cells as power sources, which combined hydrogen and oxygen into water. And as a byproduct, they got a whole bunch of energy from that chemical reaction and that was used to power all their ship systems. You might recall in Apollo 13, when the oxygen tank had exploded, which removed their ability to provide power and indeed generate oxygen and clean the air for the crew. So they had to come up with some kind of brilliant little uh, carbon filter. They huddled in the lunar module to replenish oxygen uh, during their return trip to Earth. Now in Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17, and the Skylab missions, that issue was corrected by putting in redundant power systems and making a more durable casing for the oxygen tanks. But still, fuel cells have a limited lifetime. And granted, solar cells do too, but solar cells degrade at a rate of about 2% a year, which is a lot longer lifetime than you get from uh, fuel cells alone, which require regular replenishment. You might ask, if we're having hydrogen and oxygen combined to make water, why can't we split up hydrogen and oxygen again and just repeat the cycle all over again? Well, it comes down to conservation of energy. You have to input power to create that hydrogen and oxygen. And there are always inefficiencies in the system. So you're gonna lose a little bit every time you repeat that process. It costs more energy to split it and recombine it. The entire hydrogen oxygen fuel cell system is not a perfect closed loop system and cannot provide indefinite energy. Okay, so Orion uses fuel cells, which gives it a longer lifetime, which means you can send it on deeper space missions, but it's still pretty small. Four people inside that little cabin don't have a lot of room to move around, but they do have some amenities that might be worth considering. For example, the Orion capsule is built on some of the knowledge we've gained from watching our astronauts in low gravity for extended periods of time. So they've included uh, exercise equipment that are very compact that uh, astronauts can use that during their long commute to the moon and back, which takes four days, just one way alone, not including the transfer to Gateway, uh, the entire lunar mission and return to Earth which altogether is about a 30 day mission. In addition to that, being so far away from Earth for such a long period of time can potentially expose the astronauts to extreme radiation hazards, including the event of a solar storm. Now, Apollo got lucky. There was no solar storms during the Apollo era that were significant enough to cause them severe radiation exposure, but it could happen. Now, Orion comes equipped with a radiation storm shelter, which is located behind the crew and can be used in the event of a solar storm. Now, by including a radiation shelter in Orion, that means they don't have to include one in the Mars habitat, which is part of the larger mission to mount, mount a, an inflatable habitat to the nose of a nuclear thermal propulsion system, which will take a couple of Orion capsules onward to Mars. So if a solar storm occurs during the long trip to Mars, which can take six to nine months, they can retreat to the capsules and use those radiation shelters, protecting the crew and enabling longer term exploration missions. So you might recall during the descent to the lunar surface in Apollo 11, there was a 1202 program alarm. 1202. 1202. 32,500 feet. 25. Give us a reading on the 1202 program. That was the onboard computer getting overloaded. And it doesn't take much for that to happen. They were running on analog computers at the time. And even fast forward into the space shuttle era, during ascent, they had to switch out the onboard programming for the guidance and control system from atmospheric flight to orbital flight. And they did that using floppy disks. 
Yeah. So you can imagine how rudimentary the Apollo systems must have been. So fast forward to today where we have thousands and thousands of, of floppy disk worth of data carrying around in our pockets at all time. A lot of that complicated control schemes that you might see when looking at pictures of the Apollo capsule, but with all the switches and buttons and levers, well, that's not really necessary anymore. We can just have uh, a few buttons and a touchscreen, a much more integrated and complete compact control system, which frees up a lot of space for the astronauts to move in. So a lot more of this habitable volume is able to be used. And that's why we can have this big space for the radiation shelter and this fold out exercise equipment. On top of that, there's also a actual toilet on board the Orion capsule. Now you might say, well, that's obvious, right? Of course they're gonna have a toilet. Well, they didn't in Apollo. They didn't have a dedicated toilet. They had to kind of, well, let's say manually um, use the bathroom. And there was pretty much no privacy. You might have heard during several recordings that uh, Neil Armstrong was commenting, oh, there's a turd floating around. It was kind of hard to deal with some of the hygienics issues involved in Apollo. And there's a lot of learning that we did during Apollo, Skylab, Space Station, and Space Shuttle. And we've applied some of that here. There we go. Yeah, get some lava lamping going. You might recall that during Mike Pence's announcement in March of this year for putting boots on the moon in 2024, he said that the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon. So that means we're gonna have both men and women on board these capsules during their trip to the moon. So this onboard toilet is not only a functioning toilet, but has a privacy screen. So it's definitely meant to uh, be a bit more luxurious by comparison to the Apollo modules. Another difference is the service modules. Now we already mentioned that the Apollo capsule is powered by solar power instead of just fuel cells that were on board for Apollo. But the service module behind me with the solar panels is actually the European service module. Now by including this European service module into our big Artemis ambitions symbolizes a big change in our mentality and the, indeed the capabilities of the international community as a whole. We're going to do another episode about international cooperation and missions and how important that is. But by bringing in uh, more international partners on in our missions, we're kind of cementing our ambitions going forward. Now, the final difference I'm gonna talk about is the atmosphere. The Apollo capsules ran at about five PSI or 34.5 kilopascals of atmospheric pressure, and it was a pure oxygen environment. We've learned since then about the volatility of being exposed to pure oxygen environments and transitioning from those pure oxygen environments to a more pressurized environment, such as Earth's atmosphere by itself. Plus the volatility of the oxygen environment by itself means if there's a spark, then everything goes boom. So instead of using that pure oxygen environment, we have an oxygen nitrogen environment at twice the pressure, 70 kilopascals or 10.2 atmospheres. Even so, usually we run spacesuits at, at the Apollo-like five atmospheres of pure oxygen environment. And the reason that is, is because when you get inside these highly pressurized spacesuits, it becomes hard to move the joints. In fact, the astronauts say that the first thing that gets tired on spacewalks is their hands because they're constantly having to fight the pressure difference between inside the suit and the vacuum of space. And so by reducing the internal pressure of the spacesuit, it makes it easier to move around and interact. So there's still gonna be a transition between EVA activities and onboard the Orion capsule and inside the gateway itself. In conclusion, the big differences between the Apollo and Orion capsules pretty much comes down to crew accommodation and size. So we already covered that the Orion capsule is much bigger. It also has a lot of creature comforts that are required to keep the crew in a healthier condition for a longer period of time, including exercise equipment and a radiation shelter and just more space in general. And plus the advancements of technology between 1961 and today have been included and integrated with the capsule itself using flight proven hardware and new technology that makes it more resilient, more capable and safer for the crew. That's it, thanks for joining me. Um, and tune in next time where we're going to be talking about thermal control systems for spacecraft. Cheers. Roger, we copy. At the Earth, right out our front window.